Now let's look at what really makes us human. The fact that we can talk, that we can convey complex ideas to other individuals of our own species. When humans first left Africa, modern humans, Homo sapiens, left Africa, having originated about 100,000 years ago, we left about 45,000 years ago into Europe. Europeans intermingled and interbred to some extent with the Neanderthals. Other branches of the human trees spread off to Asia. The Asians then went directly across the Bering Straits eventually to the New World. Actually, even some Europeans are now believed to have made it over there as well by about 15,000 years ago. There was a southern lineage that followed the coast of Asia and made it all the way down to Australia, the Aborigines. And in fact, these may have been some of the first to leave Africa about 70,000 years ago. This is based on some hair samples that were collected in, in uh, Australia and then been dated by carbon dating. Point is that we have a common origin from Africa, one species that then radiated out over all the rest of the Earth. And what we can now do by looking at language, because all these people can talk, everybody has language once we left as Homo sapiens, we can look at distinctions, similarities in the vocabulary, syntax, all the aspects of our languages across the world, and we can do a classification just like we would if we were using DNA. And what we find is that modern languages do indeed reveal a common ancestry. If we look at European languages, so French, German, Latin, Italian, all of those, they're so similar to each other in that broad scheme of things that they all would cluster on one little twig down here. But to the European languages, there are clear relationships to Iranian and other Southwest Asian languages, to even North, North African languages, going back up eventually over to India, etc. We have a whole bunch of other languages that are found geographically around the Pacific Islands, Polynesia, Micronesia, Melanesia, okay? The African languages are more similar to each other than they are to the others in the other parts of the world. So we have then this diversification, kind of mutation in the use of words, just as we'd see in genetics. So. Putting all this together, it's possible to say that of the 504 languages that are now found around the world, you have the likely origin of language being down in southwestern Africa, that as people move north, some of this original diversity would, was changing, and you have now new languages appearing, and you have distinct waves of similarity as you go further and further away from Africa. So all this, again, emphasizes the common ancestry of all mankind from Africa. Now, what is it that allows us to have language? And again, I want to start with a proximal mechanism. I want to look at the genetics of the capacity for speech. And this is a truly fascinating study of a family that have a very severe speech disorder. So here we have a genealogy, a pedigree, where we have those individuals that have this dark symbol are incapable of proper speech. They've been able to have family, to have offspring, and this trait's passed on. Okay? And it turns out that it's a single dominant autosomal allele that's passed on to sons and daughters, generation after generation, in this so-called KE family, that if they possess this dominant autosomal allele, they cannot speak properly. And the gene that is being passed on, it's been possible to locate that specific allele doing the pedigree analysis and then genetic testing, is that it's caused by a mutation on what's called the FOXP2 gene, which is found on the seventh chromosome in humans. Okay? And so this one protein, if you don't have a functioning copy of it, you can't have language. Okay? And if you compare the FOXP2 gene in modern humans with the homolog, because chimpanzees also have a FOXP2 gene, so do gorillas, so do orangs, so do rhesus monkeys, so do mice even. And you can look at the number of base pair substitutions between each one of these variants, and it's possible to estimate that the modern, the normal FOXP2 gene, the one that allows us to talk, 
must have originated about 120,000 years ago. And that's about when we saw those first artistic workshops. We see all this flourishing of human culture. What's really interesting, again, at this genetic level, is that having identified this one allele as being so important, is how it works. The FOXP2 is a pleiotropic allele. That is, it affects more than one different physical trait. So it influences facial movement, the ability to move your mouth to articulate sounds, and also neurological development of the brain, which controls your memory for being able to remember all those different words. So the FOXP2 gene seems to be, in fact, the gene that allows language in humans. So, what are the key events that we've seen in human evolution? Enlarged brain size. The proximate cause, as we saw, were changes in regulatory genes. It only took a few changes to get a bunch more proteins that would ultimately cause a larger brain. And although I didn't mention it, there's also data to suggest that in our larger brains we have many more connections between the different neurons so that we're able to connect a lot more information with our brains. Ultimately, though, what selected for those regulatory genes to act in that way was the fact that we are primates, we descended from the trees, we have a very complex lifestyle, and we developed a huge reliance on memory. So that selected for the need for a much larger brain. The consequence of that was once we had those large brains, we could have culture. Instead of having to learn everything from scratch, we could copy our elders, we could copy successful individuals of our own society, and quickly adopt new behaviors. Now we've just seen language. The proximate cause, what enables mechanistically for us to speak and remember words, seems to be this human variant FOXP2 gene. Ultimately, well, maybe it was the need to be able to coordinate our groups. Maybe we needed to be able to work together perhaps to pull down large prey, or maybe to do battle with other family groups of other humans. We'll discuss that more later. Clearly a consequence of Hamming language is we see this true flourishing of art, music, religion, and large-scale societies.